Okay. So, uh, which I was doing for uh, uh, almost two years. So today we're go going to hand, uh, get hands on some new models about this topic. So uh, first of all, I would like to make some comment. We'll be focusing on a small part of computer vision tasks, as I, as, as I said, uh, which is the passive binocular several reconstruction. Uh, I think most of the people from RI especially may have already got certain level of experiences, especially from some CV courses, uh, both uh, undergraduate and graduate courses. You may be uh, played with some stereo function already. So today, let's get a bit, a little bit more involved into this uh, topic. And uh, the, the outline of the topics will be like this. We're starting from the stereo vision 101. It's, I, have, I, have, I will have a very basic uh, and the simple uh, review flow of what stereo vision does, and all the way to the uh, non-learning method, recent non-learning method, and learning methods, and advanced learning method, and relative tasks. So let's get started with the, uh, uh, the basics. Uh, first of all, there is a, uh, I think it's pretty good review paper that if, if you want to get a broad view of what is happening for binocular stereo, you can uh, look at this paper. And the leading author have some other related work, especially on stereo vision. Uh, for the uh, stereo vision 101, um, so we'll do a quick review of uh, binocular stereo vision and uh, I'll give some tips on uh, stereo calibration on your world. Uh, when people say reconstruction, uh, we usually refer to dense re reconstruction or uh, surface reconstruction, actually. For dense reconstruction, we often talk about reconstruction error, validity, uh, certainty, uncertainty, occlusion, and efficiency. Um, so uh, everything should be dense, and we have to do prediction for every pixel. That is different for sparse reconstruction, like what the people normally do for visual geometry and the SLAM. They use uh, reliable, robust features to do the reconstruction. But for, for me, we have to do dense reconstruction. And uh, for uh, particularly for binocular stereo, it's, it's, uh, the principle is really straightforward. As you may also uh, may already learn from CV courses that we have two images from two cameras. And let me do this, okay. So we have two cameras uh, place, uh, 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 if we have two uh, scenarios. Uh, if, if we have only one camera and this camera makes a movement along the X axis uh, indicated like this, and we assume that the scene is stationary uh, and we can get two images. And uh, uh, the same way that if we have two identical cameras placed along the X axis, and uh, the images from these two cameras taken simultaneously. We get uh, a pair of stereo images as shown on this page. So what you can get from these two images. So it's rather simple, right? The key observation, the key observation is that um, the images of objects move horizontally with magnitudes inverse proportional to the distance between the objects and the camera. Uh, that is uh, saying if the object is near the camera, uh, it will be moved left and right uh, with magnitude, magnitude larger than object far away from the camera. For, for this example, the, uh, uh, as you can see here, uh, oh, we, we have an edge here, and from the left image to the right image, it's moved a little bit. But if you see the background, it's, bar it's barely moved. So this is a simple principle. And from the uh, CV courses, we can uh, define some uh, ter terminologies and simple mathematics to uh, formulate it. So what we uh, are interested in is to measure uh, uh, the, the coordinate difference of a point in 3D uh, in the images from the two cameras. So from this, this setup, we have uh, the image from the left camera and the image from right camera. So uh, for now, we will uh, call this image as the reference image, and this image as the test image. So for a same point in the 3D space, uh, we have two images, we have two projections on the image plane of those two cameras. So here is, it should be X and X prime. So the value we are interested in is the difference between these two X. 
So, so we call it this disparity as defined on our CV courses. And another uh, important uh, terminology is this one's baseline. It's basically the length or the distance the, the camera, the distance camera moved or the, uh, or the distance between those two cameras. So here we are additionally assuming that those cameras are calibrated and the images we get already uh, is in a distorted and a rectified way. Uh, for rectified, I mean a projection onto the image on the reference image should be on the same row of the test image. So I'm assuming that you guys have already taken uh, the similar courses and that you all know these concepts. So this image is copied from, uh, from this course from Samu. I cannot, I cannot pronounce the name of the person, but uh, as, it, as you can see, this is a Samu uh, uh, graduate course. So uh, uh, there's a bunch of names uh, calling this uh, process to evaluate the disparity. We can call it binocular stereo reconstruction or stereo vision or stereo depth prediction, all of the same that we want to predict the, the disparity. So the relationship between the uh, actual, the, 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 dense, uh, the depth or the distance from the uh, 3D point to the camera and the disparity is really, is, uh, is really simple. It's a inverse proportional uh, relationship. Here we have the baseline and the focal length f. So uh, uh, if you want, want to recover, if you get the disparity, if uh, once you want to recover the depth, the z, the z, uh, you just uh, interchange the places of the d of the z. So normally we measure z and b in metric unit, which is meter, and we measure focal length and disparity in pixels. Uh, another relationship I want would like to point out that uh, normally people do not talk about it is the disparity sensitivity. Uh, for me, uh, the previous tasks uh, all well, well concern, well consider the uh, reconstruction error. So uh, uh, for binocular stereo, the, uh, the error, uh, if you make one pixel error in your disparity prediction, you will be making uh, uh, a certain uh, level of depth uh, error. So the relationship will be looking like this. It's really simple, it's a linear, uh, I mean, first the first order derivative of the depth respect to the disparity, and if you if you uh, run through the mass, it's really simple. The relationship will be looked at like this. Uh, this basically tell us that uh, at certain disparity value, if you make one pixel of uh, disparity error, you will get a depth error uh, proportional to the square of the actual depth of the object. So for lower error sensitivity, we, we want to move the camera closer to the object and the use larger baseline or use longer focal length, uh, focal length length. So I have a simple quiz question for you guys. Uh, does the higher resolution or using larger image size help to make uh, the error sensitivity lower? You, you can think about uh, uh, the relationships between the, the focal length and the image size, what's, what's the uh, relationship between the uh, similarity of the triangles? Just think it in, in your head. So actually, if you're only uh, using large images, uh, that might not help you to get lower uh, disparity sensitivity uh, because uh, you, you may make, if you didn't change the length, you may make more uh, disparity errors than small, smaller images. And the other issue is if the size of the uh, imaging sensor in the camera didn't change, but the resolution goes up, uh, you will have smaller uh, physical pixels on the sensors. So the noise level will go up and also for, sort of other things because, uh, such as thermal uh, deformation of the sensors. So you will make more uh, errors in terms of disparity. So uh, if you're only uh, using large image or higher resolution, that, not, that might not help you to lower the error sensitivity. Um, if you have a disparity map for the reference image, how can you recover the 3D points? It should be easy, right? And uh, uh, once you recover the point, what kind of uh, coordinate system you're going to use? What kind of orientation you want your point cloud to be pointing to? 
and how can you uh, handle points at infinity? That practical point uh, uh, issues we have to consider in real world applications. But the, the, the remaining question and the fundamental question is how to find per pixel correspondence and how hard can be. So I, I don't know guys if you if you know these people. <laughs> His name is Jeremy Flaxen. Okay, so how hard it, it could be to to match uh, pixels from the reference image to the test image. And here I list uh, some issues that we may we, we might uh, we may uh, confront encountered in uh, in real world applications uh, that tell us that tells us simple principles may not work if you naively compare image patches between the re reference image and test image. Uh, for example, yeah, we have to handle low texture and the rep repetitive texture regions. Uh, for example, uh, in here and here, we barely have any textures to match between those images. And here on the wall, we have repetitive uh, textures. Um, uh, we have to, uh, because we have two uh, images from two camera poses, we got to have occlusions. So how can you identify and uh, handle occlusions is another issue. Um, and from, if you have two cameras and not one single camera which is moving, you have to deal with some color in, in, in inconsistency which we have encountered in real life. And some lens issues like the vigilating effects and some uh, real world issues like the reflections of the surface of the objects and the focus of the uh, lens. So for, for these uh, effects, I'm talking about effects like, like this one, that the border of the image getting darker because the, of the lens. So I imagine you have two images. So uh, the, 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 the reference image and test image. So the right border of the reference image will be dark. So the color will be inconsistent between those two images. And, and in, real, uh, in real world applications, you have to deal with low lighting and noise and motion blur. And the, you have to constantly make, make sure that your calibration between those two cameras are, are good. And the, the last one, uh, the state the shape of the uh, image patches may be, may be changing because uh, the viewing point of the camera are different. So uh, what I mean is, uh, let's, let's say for example, this, this, this red uh, uh, region here in the reference image, uh, the, the width between these two uh, points and these two points is different uh, in, in the test image because the camera is moving to the right and the shape of these uh, small surface will be different. I mean, the size and, and the aspect ratio. And here uh, to illustrate other uh, uh, issues, I have a, a, a example image patch uh, marked as the red re rectangle in these two images. So in the reference image, inside this uh, red re rectangle, we barely have any textures. And what we have is strong signal from this edge but the real um, matching point in the test uh, image is here. We can see from the background, we have additional strong signals. So these two image patch cannot be matched rel reliably. We have to deal with, deal with all these uh, issues in a per pixel manner. And the pixel in nature is an integer representation of the real world. It's a discrete representation. So we have to do uh, integer computation and we have to do it per pixel. Uh, this is bas basically what the stereo vision is. And I, here I provide some uh, uh, tips and ex uh, experiences from, uh, from my previous work uh, considering the stereo calibration because uh, most of the time uh, uh, the calibration is really important. And I think people are already familiar uh, with those tools that are provided by Ross and uh, Calibar that you can use this uh, tools to, to, to do calibration. So uh, uh, specifically for roles, uh, the package called camera calibration is essentially using the OpenCV uh, uh, implementation. And you can do the calibration also in my lab, but the uh, underlying uh, operation uh, also ta is taken out by OpenCV. 
So for, for custom a stereo setup, if you, you set up your stereo camera with, uh, by yourself, you have to make sure that the time is synced and timestamps are the same. Uh, I have to particularly uh, uh, to make thanks to Rohit uh, that he pointed out in my early uh, experiments that my timestamp is doesn't uh, consistent with within those two cameras and making all sorts of trouble. And uh, the other one is uh, if you want to go higher accuracy, you have you may have to calibrate the cameras individually uh, because if you only do one single stereo calibration, the distortion of the camera may be not reliably uh, calibrated because all the features you detected are on the overlap region of the cameras. So for example, the left side of the left camera, the right side of the right camera, have no uh, have any have don't have any features to to use to do the uh, distortion calibration. Um, the for uh, a custom stereo setup, you may have to implement uh, some custom auto exposure uh, functionalities. Uh, I have a simple Im implementation. If you're interested, that you can look at it. And maybe you have to deal with the dark environments and uh, especially the vision lighting effect. Uh, what we, as we talked uh, uh, previously, and I have a simple tool to do uh, auto uh, to do a uh, calibration on the vision lighting, and uh, you may have to calibrate the color as well. Uh, for the Shimizu project, I get involved in. We are using a color target. It's basically basically a printed a paper with color reference that you can track the color, uh, but uh, after you getting the images. So that's it. That's the, basically the uh, uh, the basics of the stereo vision. So uh, then uh, next we'll visit some uh, recent non-learning methods. But before that, I want to point some point out some uh, openly available datasets that we can use to to test our uh, stereo uh, methods or models or do some benchmarking. So the datasets are uh, uh, like this: uh, some frequency frequently used this data set, especially for stereo vision, and some other related data set for um, monocular vision. Uh, the first one is the TT data set. I think everybody knows it. And it provides us with some image sequence with both the uh, left image and uh, a red image. The image resolution is uh, looks like this. And it's outdoors shelf driving uh, scenario. Uh, one thing uh, particularly for this data set is that the true uh, disparity value is provided as the uh, as a in a sparse manner that they, they use a lidar scanner to get the true uh, depths of the pixels corresponding pixels and then and then the true value will be sparse. Uh, another uh, uh, data set is the SynFlow data set. Uh, uh, here I put the some uh, example images. Here this data set is a uh, uh, they get images from simulation. And the, the, the number of images is relatively large. It's, it's about uh, 30k of training uh, images, and about there are about 4,000 images for testing. And the specifically, or particularly, the the valid disparity range is up to uh, about about 200 pixels. That is really important because you cannot train effectively train a a, a model that have uh, targeting higher le level of disparity range. So for this particular uh, data set, uh, some true disparity may have some large value, and uh, some cases may have extreme large uh, disparity values. If you're using this, this data set, uh, you better uh, filter the uh, true disparity values for yourself. Uh, otherwise, maybe uh, your training will get slow. And there, but there is another driving uh, scenario data set for, for SimFlow. I didn't list here, and I didn't use it. Uh, for my project. And the third one is the Middlebury data set. It's relatively old. And the, 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 uh, the images from this data set is relatively large. So if you want to evaluate your model on large image with large range of disparity values, you can use this data set. They provide uh, training sets and test sets. Uh, the training set have uh, ground truth values like this one and the uh, occlusion masks like this one. And for monocular uh, uh, related task, we have the NYU data set. Uh, for this data set, they use a RGBD uh, camera to get the true depth of the scene. As you can see here, that the true depth is not that good because the 
uh, performance of the underlying filter. Uh, but for but for this is data set, they have some segmentation uh, true tag uh, wrong choose tags that you can use to train your uh, multitask models. And for even larger image size, and uh, uh, there there exists a data set like this one, the the ETH three D, and they are using uh, the DSLRs to taking images. And this one is particularly uh, challenging because, as you can see, uh, they targeting some environments with no textures and uh, a lot of occlusions here. So for the ground truth label, they are providing some kind of LiDAR scan as ground truth uh, for you to train a test your model. I have to mention that we have our own uh, uh, stereo uh, data set from our token air. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, we have a lot of images and uh, it's from a uh, simulation from AirSim. And uh, the environment is not like what we get from SimFlow because in SimFlow, uh, things are flowing uh, in front of the camera. Uh, for Tartan Air, the camera is, uh, uh, is flying inside the environment. And we have pretty challenging things uh, to, to deal with. So uh, for those uh, benchmarks and data sets, what kind of metrics we can use? Uh, basically, there, is, there are two uh, uh, metrics we can use. The first one is, uh, is the EPE error, endpoint error. It's actually the, the average error of, uh, of disparities. And uh, sometimes people refer this to as the MAE uh, error, which is the uh, mean absolute error. And it's pretty simple. And the other one is from the Kitty data set that people are using the one pixel and three pixel uh, matrix. They, uh, for those, uh, they are meaning uh, uh, you have to count the ratio of your prediction uh, compared with the ground truth disparities. Uh, how many pixels are making uh, an error larger than one pixel and you calculate the ratio and you do the same thing for three pixels and you report the, the value. So it's, it's a really uh, simple thing. So uh, let's do a quick summary on what we already discussed so far. Um, for, tra for training you uh, deep neural networks on those data sets, you, you better to filter the bad training data uh, by yourself and filter some, uh, uh, and, and you have to filter the disparity range according to your needs. So you cannot uh, train, tr train the model outside the range of the of disparity provided by the data set. Uh, but if your targeting range is smaller, you, you better have to filter the disparity range as well. And you can use uh, data augmentation for, for it, of course, like uh, random crop, like doing some stuff onto the color, to the color tone of the images. And uh, it's basically the data set bad parts we, 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 can, we have right now. And uh, let's move to the recent non learning methods. Uh, we will particularly focus on two of, the, of those methods, which is uh, uh, SPS stereo, which is multitask stereo method, and another uh, uh, sparse measurement guided method. And both of those two methods are based on the SGM method. So we will take SGM method as our baseline. So SGM is, uh, is uh, uh, the name is the abbreviation of semi global matching, I think. Most of the people know this, this method. So for stereo uh, reconstruction, basically SGM, what uh, SGM does is uh, in uh, uh, several steps. Uh, the most important two steps is the matching cost computation and matching cost aggregation. So at, at least some uh, crazy uh, equations here. Uh, for the first one uh, is the uh, high level uh, formulation of the underlying problem. Uh, they form, they, we can formulate the stereo matching problem as a uh, Markov random field like this. So we have a uh, single pixel matching uh, uh, cost here as the uh, data term and some additional uh, sm a sm a smooth cost term here. And we want to minimize the uh, total cost for every pixels to every possible disparities. So how, how can they uh, compute the matching cost is one problem. And the other one is uh, aggregate uh, the, the matching cost for individual pixels. For uh, SGM, what they are doing is they aggregate, uh, aggregate the cost from pixels along 
uh, different directions. So here I have a uh, illustration. Uh, once, once we want to aggregate cost into this red pixel, we have to uh, starting from border and run, run through this direction and aggregate all the cost along this direction and to the red pixel. So uh, this equation is, uh, is basically uh, uh, what, what they did for uh, cost aggregation. So here, uh, the, the, the P is the, uh, you, can, you, you, you can take it as the index or the coordinates of the pixel of, the, of the, this red pixel. And R is the direction. It's a, a positive one or minus one in the value. So uh, this basically means uh, uh, we aggregate uh, uh, cost along a, a, li a linear direction because the R is a minus one uh, and uh, because R has value one. And after we uh, aggregate the cost into these pixels and we, we can we can get a uh, result termed as the, the S value. So we can uh, find the uh, S value uh, according to the dis uh, every possible disparity and choose the lowest S value uh, as the best cost, uh, uh, minimum cost, and use that disparity as the disparity for this pixel P. So I have some simple uh, quiz questions for this uh, SGM setup. So for every pixel in the reference image, how many S values we have? And the answer is uh, the number of uh, possible disparities. So let's say we have a million pixels and for each pixels, we have to search for uh, the number of uh, disparities uh, uh, values for S and choose the minimum S for each pixel. And what, what this uh, L, uh, uh, expression or equation uh, encourages. Uh, the answer is, is here that, so uh, from this equation, this uh, L value encourage, encourages uh, consistency between uh, the current pixel and its, na its neighbors. If the, if the best disparity for the neighboring pixel uh, disagree with the current pixel, uh, there, there, there will be a additional cost termed as the a P, a P1 value. So uh, the, the LR encourages uh, similar disparity values between neighbors. So in the extreme case, it won't, uh, all of your neighbors have the same disparity. So it encourages uh, a parallel plan uh, respect to the image plan. So which is the front, uh, frontal parallel assumption. So the remaining question is how to compute the, the matching cost, which is C, C value. And uh, here we have this uh, example images again. So if we want to uh, compute the cost, we can uh, crop out a image patch from reference image and try to uh, match it along the uh, possible disparity values along the X uh, axis in the uh, test image. So here is, is the minimum possible disparity. Uh, here is the max, maximum possible disparity because we hit the, the boundary of the image. And uh, inside those uh, region, there should be a true disparity. That's its uh, assumption. So, uh, so to, to, cap, to compute the matching cost, so what, what is the matching cost actually? Is this a measure of similarity or something else? So what's, uh, uh, what method people are using to represent the cost value or similarity? Uh, here I have list some uh, methods that we can use to, 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 to compute the matching cost or to compare the uh, similarities between image patches. So we can just uh, uh, do a direct subtraction or do some uh, summation of the uh, difference between those two image patches. Uh, that's we, uh, uh, one of these method, this category of methods called SAD, which is the sum of absolute differences. And we, uh, 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 based on this, we can do all kinds of norms of the, of the differences of the, those image patches as well. And also we can do cross correlation between those two image patches. Uh, we can use mutual information, uh, all kinds of future. We can compare the structural similarity 
and we have you can use uh, other um, measurement uh, uh, information measurement like the Hamming distance of census transform, or we can use some uh, probabilistic method like the uh, patch match. So uh, you can get have a guess what the OpenCV uh, uh, SGM method is using as the uh, measure of similarity. Actually, uh, th those methods implemented in OpenCV is uh, 20 years old. It's using the simple one here. So I, I put a, a link, the, the source code link for this uh, OpenCV implementation of the uh, matching cost. Uh, if you are interested, you can uh, take a look at it. And, you can, and uh, we can have a guess what the deep learning methods models are using as the measurement of similarity or matching cost. Uh, actually, uh, lots of lots of them are uh, get used. Uh, we can use the simplest one. We can use the uh, correlation. We can use the structural similarity, and even we can use the Hamming distance of census transform. Uh, we we can discuss it a little bit later uh, in the presentation. So, uh, what SGM offers us as a baseline? Uh, we can take a look at the be uh, very uh, benchmark uh, if we search SGBM, which is the uh, uh, implementation of the OpenCV, you can see from different uh, testing uh, uh, scene, what kind of disparity map it can get, what kind of error it makes. So, it's, so this method is 20 years old. Uh, we can get some uh, results like this one. Um, this is our baseline. Have to okay. Um, uh, let's talk about some recent methods. Uh, those uh, those methods are also based on uh, the SGM or uh, SGBM method. So the first the first one is the SPS step stereo, which is uh, a multitask method. It, is, it does uh, the plan segmentation and stair reconstruction at the same time. So there is a key idea from this method that is, that is the disparity values are changing slowly between uh, visually similar neighbors. That means if, if your neighbor pixel have, some, have a similar uh, color intensity uh, with, the, with, the pixel, with, with the current pixel, uh, the disparity should be the same. Uh, the disparity should changing slowly. So what what they are the method they are using that they assume that there there will be a local plan uh, for each pixel in the pixel disparity space. Uh, by which I mean uh, it's a three dimensional space that you have your pixel coordinate for uh, for a pixel x and y, and the uh, disparity uh, correspond to this pixel. And in, in this space, in, in this pixel disparity space, there is a plan. And the neighboring pixels uh, around the, uh, 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 should be uh, uh, projected or, or, or you can fit a plan in this uh, pixel disparity space. So for such kind of 3D space, we normally using a linear equation to describe a plane in 3D space like this one. So, uh, uh, the author assumed that there is, there, we can do this by uh, fitting a plan in the pixel disparity space. So, so once, you, once you do that, uh, 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 let's just uh, ignore this uh, clustering of equations. So if you, want, if you do that and uh, uh, you have a new, oh, sorry, where is my mouse? Okay. So if I have a new uh, pixel that's the, with the coordinate of x, v, y, p, how can you get the uh, disparity? So you find which, which plan this pixel belongs to, and you do an interpolation inside the plan in the pixel uh, disparity space, and you, you, get a new, you get the disparity for this uh, querying pixel. So uh, there will be some uh, concerns of questions. So, the, the coordinates we are using is actually not the word coordinates, it's the, uh, 
coordinates in, in the image, in the image is the pixel coordinate. So uh, in, in those equations, the, the author uh, provides uh, the index i is not the index of pixels. It's the index of the individual small plan, plans in, in, in the pixel disparity space. So uh, uh, when they derive their equations, let's say the, uh, the vectors in the pixel disparity space, like the p vector and the, and the normal vector, they are all in the pixel disparity space. It's not the normal uh, 3D space we are, uh, we, we, are, we are using. So there are some uh, corner case for, for this setup. Like uh, if, we, if we are using this uh, vector to represent the normal vector of the plane in the pixel disparity space, what happens if the NDI is zero? So that basically cannot happen if you if, uh, if, if you look closely to the uh, mathematics data. So uh, there remains a an, an last question, which is, uh, is the segment in the pixel disparity space also a plane in 3D camera frame? So the answer is yes. So it's, it's not intuitive, but I have a link here that I, I have a simple PDF file to, to prove that it, it, that is the case. Uh, a plane in pixel disparity space is actually a plane in the camera uh, uh, frame, uh, which, which we uh, uh, usually use for, to describe a 3D space. So uh, this assumes that we have a initial, uh, this assumes that word is made by piecewise uh, flat, flat planes, and it needs an initial disparity map to fit those plans. So where to get those initial uh, disparity predictions? It's actually from the SGM method. So they use SGM method to predict initial disparity and fit plans in the pixel disparity space and then do the other stuff. So the method is from this paper. Uh, it's ECC 2014. And they first they do the SGM method and then they do the uh, plan segmentation and smoothing and other stuff. So we can uh, simply uh, ignore those equations. That is, uh, it's a joint optimization problem. Uh, if, if you are interested, you can look closer to the uh, uh, mathematical formulations. So what kind of result we can get from this method? So this is an uh, image from the middle value dataset. And this is this disparity value output from this method. As we can see, it's pretty, pretty good that we have uh, smoothly changing surfaces in the scene. And this is the uh, segmentation of the uh, plans in, inside the scene. So for different uh, 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 regions, uh, it's, it's actually different segments and uh, the boundaries are of different colors, meaning different uh, 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 intersection of the segments. Like the gray uh, boundaries are all coplanar between a uh, coplanar uh, plans uh, 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 with, uh, as, as neighbors uh, are striding the, those uh, gray boundaries. So there are, there are a bunch of similar uh, works, like uh, the Michael Case team has a, a similar work on, on this uh, kind of implementation. So this is the first one, uh, non learning method, which, which, which was doing a multitask uh, stereo. And the other one is, uh, I would like to uh, discuss is a guided uh, stereo method. So guided is, I mean, uh, we can use some sparse measurement from other sensors as a guidance uh, for the SGM method and to get better results. So this paper is from uh, last year's uh, ICRA uh, uh, conference. And people are using a LiDAR sensor as a uh, ground truth measurement. It's a kind of sparse measurement and we can uh, leverage uh, the information provided in those sparse measurements and uh, uh, pro promote the results from the SGM method. Here is the image from their paper that they propose uh, three uh, different methods to incorporate the sparse LiDAR measure measurement. Uh, the first one, they call it the neighborhood support. It's, 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 uh, it's also called a naive uh, method. And, and the, the the other two are based on the diffusion uh, 
a theory and they have a, a simple diffusion method and a uh, uh, improved diffusion, diffusion method. They call it an isotropic diffusion. So we can look closely what they are doing using the sparse uh, measurement from LiDAR. Uh, the first one is naive fusion. Uh, it's basically uh, saying uh, if the current pixel has a corresponding measurement from LiDAR, we can trust the measurement. And we can uh, change the matching cost for this pixel to zero and leave other pixel uh, untouched. And this is really naive and, uh, and this doesn't work too well. So then they provide an, another method they call a neighborhood promotion. What, what it does, what it basically does is it uh, not only modify the matching cost for the pixels that has corresponding LiDAR measurement, they also modify the neighboring pixels of the LiDAR measurement. So we can omit the details of this one. If you're interested, you can look at it. And the third method they, they are providing is uh, they, they use some kind of weight computation to weight different uh, neighbors around a LiDAR measurement. Uh, they are essentially using the bilateral, bilateral filter and they get a uh, weight matrix uh, uh, with res respect to the nearest LiDAR measurement and uh, using the, the weight to update the matching cost from the SGM method and try to uh, leverage the information provided by the LiDAR. So uh, their, uh, their paper uh, have some uh, uh, equations to uh, explain their method. But once you look at the actual code, uh, the code is, is not consistent with the equations they provided in the paper. Uh, so in, in, the, in the slides, I, I, I highlighted some uh, inconsistencies between the uh, equations and the code. And if you're interested, again, you can look at the code by yourself. And uh, from this uh, uh, research line, um, I have done some similar uh, work uh, in the guided uh, uh, stereo matching uh, methods. So uh, what I propose is to is also update the matching cost uh, from the SGM method. So here we have, again, the SGM method. So after the SGM, we have the S value for each pixel uh, uh, correspond to uh, each uh, possible disparities. So what I did is to update this S value uh, according to uh, two values uh, uh, produ uh, produced by a deep learning model. Uh, if if uh, this, these two uh, uh, values are a, uh, a targeting a disparity and a uncertainty value. So use these two values, I can uh, reweight or rescale the S value to a new value and using this uh, updated S value to do the, uh, to find the best uh, disparity. So this is the result I get from my pre previous method. Uh, as you can see that if we do nothing, there is a lot of uh, uh, bad areas and then if we leverage the information provided by deep learning model, we can do much better. So uh, that's pr pretty is the, uh, the new uh, uh, learning models uh, to the binocular uh, uh, stereo reconstruction. I would like to uh, mention two additional uh, uh, methods. Uh, one is uh, fusing, a, uh, fusing a acoustic sensor, especially uh, to want to de detect some transparent objects like glass. So the authors in this paper are using this kind of fusion to do this, uh, this glass detection uh, job. And the other one is from our, our team that uh, John has done some work on um, uh, using a polarized sensor and to do a stereo reconstruction and uh, especially for thin objects and reflective objects. It's, it's a pretty good uh, implementation. And uh, besides, uh, those uh, sensor fusion or guided uh, methods, there are, uh, there are a bunch of works on uh, fusion between cameras and TOF cameras. Uh, I didn't provide any uh, literature here because there are too, too many of them. It's, uh, essentially, they are doing the similar thing to fusing, to fusing a sparse measurement like LiDAR. Okay, uh, uh, just a, a simple summary that for this non-learning non method, they they all based on the SGM method, and then we will have to do 
uh, ca uh, ca uh, compute the matching cost and do some aggregation and do other stuff. So uh, we will trying to uh, have some hands-on uh, experience on those non-learning methods. And then uh, after we do the uh, experiments, we will discuss the learning methods. So let's do that. So at, at this time, maybe everybody is, is tired and well, well uh, fall asleep. So let's do some experiments. Um, okay, so uh, in the uh, hands-on session, we will try those two methods I just discussed. Uh, the, the first one, uh, th those two are the SPS stereo and the stereo spark step fusion. Uh, let's uh, try the uh, stereo spark step fusion first. And uh, uh, if you already run the configure script, uh, the raw uh, workspace is already compiled. So, okay. So, if you if you go to the uh, SRC folder of the stereo sparse steps fusion inside your ROS workspace. You can find a uh, local run script. And you can, uh, and, and here, you can just run this script. And what, what this script does is uh, launch the executable of a stereo sparse step fusion uh, executable and read uh, a JSON file, which is, which is this one, uh, the cases uh, dot, dot JSON. In this file, I describe the, uh, the case is already in the sample folder. So we have maybe uh, four of them. So for each of these case, if uh, a ground truth value is uh, available, uh, a Oh, uh, no. If, if the uh, intrinsic uh, parameters is available, a point cloud will be also right to the, to the file system. So we can examine the disparity uh, results and the point cloud as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it here in my computer. And uh, if you didn't get a chance to do by yourself, you can, you can see the results from, from my computer. Um, It. So as you can see, we I, I have already been in this in this uh, directory. If if you didn't uh, do the build, you can build it again. So after you uh, build this uh, raw uh, workspace, you can just fire off this this um, uh, script. So it will probably look like this. So the program will. Uh, do a random sample on the ground truth as the sparse measurement and using this measurement uh, as a guidance uh, to do uh, the, the, the dense uh, stereo reconstruction as proposed by the, by, the, by the authors. There are basically three types of uh, guidance they are using. The first one is the naive one or the neighborhood support one and the, and the other two are the diffusion based methods. So uh, for the for the test cases uh, listed in the JSON file, there there will be a, a variable called enable. If you toggle this uh, variable from true to false, you uh, it, this uh, specif specific uh, example will not be uh, run by the program. So for this way, we can tuning some parameters uh, 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 for for the uh, for the map, for, for the model. Uh, especially the random sample rate from the ground truth uh, uh, data. So the way they tested their, their, their model is they using the ground truth disparity and do random sample. So this GT sample uh, a fraction uh, a variable is controlling the, uh, how, how many samples you get from the ground truth. So the default value is 0 0.1 and you can test other values uh, as you like, like uh, 
a bigger values or smaller values and toggle, toggle this uh, 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 variable for other uh, test case from true to false and only this one will be running. And a new, and the, uh, after you run any case, the result will be saved uh, in the uh, SRC, uh, in the SRC folder here. Uh, I don't know what's happening here, but uh, it will be saved alongside these, uh, these scripts and you get your results for different uh, cases. So let me try to yes. flip all the I need to choose and run the script again. Okay, all right. Um, the reason I would like uh, to run this particular example first because I want to examine the uh, point clause. So uh, most of the time people are concerned about the disparity and what kind of uh, accuracy they can get measured in terms of disparity. But from my experience, uh, this parity is not all the, all the story. That you can get pretty good uh, error, uh, you can get a pretty performance measured by this parity. But if you convert the disparity into point calls, you can see that point calls is not that good. So for this particular example, let's, uh, if you have already run the script, let's examine what we get from the uh, Hidbury dataset. So this is the result I got as the uh, different uh, uh, fusion method from the uh, sparse measurement with, uh, I think this is from 0 0.1 sample rate. And this is the uh, disparity uh, image uh, uh, rendered as a grayscale image. From the image, you, you can argue that it's pretty good. Uh, so everything is smooth and, and seems pretty good. And if you look at uh, the output from the terminal, there will be an average error measurement in terms of disparity. So, for example, for the for the Totten error uh, data set, uh, we can get uh, zero point something an, an average error. It's, it's so good that it's the kind of illusion that you get everything done. So, uh, let's examine the point call. So, for this particular uh, example, uh, I output the underlying SGM at uh, point cloud and all other uh, 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 point cloud from other uh, fusion method. So if you already install the cloud compare uh, uh, a software, you can uh, turn, it, turn it on, uh, start the software and you can drag the point cloud in. And we can do a inspection of the point cloud. So from this angle, we can see that it kind of makes sense. Everything is good, and everything, most of the pixels are in shape. But if you look at the point cloud in another angle, in this angle. So you will see that it's something's wrong. The, the reconstruct a point clause that is not smooth at all. So what's, what's the problem here? It's why the, uh, the, uh, the program, the method gave us this kind of reconstruction. So it's basically because uh, the, the underlying strong assumption, which is called frontal parallel assumption. Uh, it is what I want to talk about th this one. So uh, as, I, as I said, uh, the al algorithm try to minimize the cost and the one particular cost is the, uh, is the uh, difference of disparity between neighboring pixels. If, if a neighboring pixels have a different disparity, it, there will be a cost. 
So this uh, essentially dictating a parallel plan uh, with respect to the camera. It is what's happening here. So the camera is, is here, uh, it's horizontal. It's, it, you can ima imagine the camera has a, a horizontal uh, image plan and all the reconstructed points want to be parallel to the camera. So you can tune the parameter to get smooth, smoother result, but the underlying uh, assumption is like this one. And if you uh, actually measure the coordinates of those points, like what I will do here using this uh, tool provided by uh, cloud, uh, cloud Compare, you can click individual points and get the the z axis uh, the, the coordinates and if you click another point you have an, a new uh, coordinate if you manually compute the difference uh, the depth difference between these two regions what you will find is that the the depth difference are corresponding to one pixel of difference so what is happening here is this region and this region only have single pixel difference measured in terms of disparity. So that is basically what's happening here. So every computation the SGM does is, is in uh, integer pixel coordinate. So they scale the integer up by 256 and do all kinds of integer computations and then scale back to the uh, true disparity range. But uh, the, the result we get from here is, is still have this kind of uh, discrete uh, 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 char characteristics that different small plants have a single pixel of disparity differences. Okay, so this is the, this is the first hands-on section and and we can try to run the other case, uh, the other uh, 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 exercise, which one, which is the SPS stereo. And the method is the same: that you go to the SRC folder of this SPS stereo uh, a package, and there is again there is a uh, local run script. And you can just run this script, and it's the same stuff. It's the same thing happening here. The, that uh, a JSON file will be read into the program, and uh, in the in the JSON file there there is different uh, samples, and the program will process the sample one by one, and the result will be saved uh, to a folder parallel to the SRC folder. It should be here. So for SPS the stereo in the in the JSON file, there will be an another uh, tunable parameter, which is the superpixel total. Uh, this number is the uh, maximum uh, segments that the program want, uh, uh, will uh, will use as an initial segmentation of the image. So for for segmentation, that uh, we are trying to uh, putting pixels with similar pixels into single segments. So uh, the, the same thing is here that there is a enable variable here. You can change it, it from true to false and uh, tune some parameters uh, in the S SPS dictionary or the SGM dictionary. So uh, again, if there there is a um, intrinsic parameter available, which is the Q data file inside the folder and the point cloud will be generated as well. So here I run all the cases. And uh, I, I would like to examine the point cloud again. So for the uh, SPS stereo, let's say we have the same data set from the With battery data set. So again, if you're looking the, uh, the, the points from this 
this angle, everything's good. And again, if we try to do this, at uh, this time we can see uh, something changed. The frontal parallel thing uh, has gone for some surfaces. But for other surfaces, we still get this kind of uh, discrete fashion of reconstructed point clouds. So if you zoom closer to the point cloud, you can see different, uh, wait a minute, I, let me change, yes. You can see small, in, uh, small point cloud uh, clusters uh, representing the small uh, image segments as plane. So there are a bunch of small plans here and here. So for this uh, method, if the real world is actually a plan, uh, then the result will be really good. Like, like this, uh, like this uh, region and this region and this region on the, on the roof of this, <laughs> of this house. But uh, if the underlying real object is not actually plan, uh, the fitting will be uh, some kind of rough optima uh, approximation of the curve uh, a surface of the object, like, like the, what we get on the on this uh, curved uh, green surface. So it's it's not a flat surface anymore, but some smaller uh, planes uh, try to approximate the spatial curving surfaces. Okay, uh, now let's move to some learning-based methods. So uh, from 2005, 2015 to 2016, uh, most of the computer vision methods are implemented as deep learning models. So the same story happens for these binocular stereo reconstruction. Uh, for the learning-based methods, I'll talk about three, uh, I'll talk three topics. The first one is some recent methods and uh, I will talk some details. And we will briefly talking about some advanced learning models, and then uh, more briefly on related tasks. So the first, first one is the uh, recent uh, deep learning models. Uh, I have a uh, uh, small list uh, get from the Kitty dataset. So uh, from this list, I list some high performance uh, the deep learning models measured by the Kitty benchmark. And for all these models, we have uh, a source code uh, released. And uh, most of them have some pre-trained models. So if you are interested, you can look at this, uh, uh, this table and try some uh, new models from, uh, from this list. Uh, but one thing I, I would like to point out that this is for the Kitty dataset. So some learning method may be overfitting the Kitty dataset. And uh, the Kitty dataset, as, uh, as we know, that is a self-driving scenario. And the scene is, uh, we, uh, the scene is uh, sort of similar between different images. We have the, the ground, and we have the sky, and we have some uh, vertical surfaces as the buildings on on, to, on uh, both sides of the image. So there's going to, there are going to be some overfit of these models. You can try some of them. Uh, something is happening here. I can't use my mouse. I have to share the screen again. Okay. Okay, cool. So uh, for the deep learning, uh, recent deep learning models, I will talk about these five topics. Uh, starting from some common components uh, all the way to some real-time uh, implementations. So for uh, stereo reconstruction or uh, related tasks uh, such as uh, monocular depth prediction and uh, optical flow, uh, we typically share some uh, similar basic components of the deep learning model. Here I list the two uh, 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 models. The first one is for optical flow from the uh, paper, uh, it's a flow knife paper here. And the second one is for uh, a, a stereo model using the 3D constant world. So uh, typically we will have some uh, uh, common components. Let's say we have feature extraction layers uh, near the uh, input images 
and we we um, uh, uh, usually we do multi-scale uh, feature extraction that that people uh, normally do uh, these days. And additionally, we will do some spatial pooling. And uh, then uh, upon those features, we will compose some kind of cost volume. And we will do some cost volume regulations using a bunch of convolutional layers of other, of other stuff. And then uh, if, if we are using a 3D cost volume, we will do some kind of classification and finally regress the disparity. If we are not using the 3D cost volume, we will directly produce the disparity from the convolutional layers. And maybe we do some refinement on the disparity to make everything, everything sharp. Uh, as, for the, uh, as for these components, uh, the, first, the first ones are the uh, feature extraction layers. Uh, it's the front end of our models. Our people are using the similar structures for different tasks. Uh, the same things happening here for stereo reconstruction. Uh, you can use some pre-trained uh, backbone like VGG or ResNet, whatever you want, whatever, whichever feature structure layer you, you like the best, and you can use that. And uh, people are also using uh, auto encoder like the structure, or encoder decoder like, uh, for example, the UNET. And uh, for better uh, receptive field, people are using the spatial pyramid. Uh, pooling layers, the SPP layers, and uh, for uh, stereo reconstruction, optical flow and monocular depth prediction, people are tend to use uh, image or feature warping to do uh, to to construct cost volume or to or to uh, compute the unsupervised loss. So uh, uh, for those, uh, if you are interested, you can look at the papers I listed here. Uh, particularly well, I'll show some structures. This, this one is the unit. I think everybody knows this, this structure. Uh, the uh, particularly interesting uh, features here is that we will con uh, concatenate uh, 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 features from previous levels after we do some uh, uh, convolution on the uh, smaller scales. So this is unit you can use as the feature instruction layers. And for receptive field, you can use the S SPP uh, layers, uh, which is the uh, spatial pooling layers. So for spatial pooling, we can, uh, we, I have seen two kinds of spatial pooling. Uh, the first one is the original one, and that you have different, uh, you have features in different size, uh, like, like, like here, uh, because they, they are for different, uh, uh, in the different stages of the uh, of your convolution layers, and then you resize those different size layers into the same size, and you can cannulate uh, them together. And the other way you can do that uh, after you re resize the features, you can do a summation or weighted summation to to get you uh, to get the final uh, feature representations. So I have seen uh, both method. And both methods works. Uh, both methods work. You can do whatever you want. So for image warping, uh, I have an example here. So uh, if you can remember, <laughs> this is the concrete pillar in front of the CFA building in our campus. So we have been away from campus for uh, 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 more than 120 days. So maybe you have forget what the campus looks like. So this is the concrete pillar uh, in front of the building. And once you compute the disparity uh, or intermediate disparity, you can use the disparity to, uh, to transform the, the right image or the test image uh, to the left hand side or to the reference image coordinates. So you, you typically uh, get results like this one. So as you can see, I use two arrows to pointing to some interesting regions. So for the green regions, we have after if the disparity prediction is right, after the warping, uh, we have a, uh, a new image and image pattern that makes sense to to, to us. But for the red errors, uh, it doesn't make sense at all because those regions are near the occlusion regions. So while you're using uh, image warping to to uh, to uh, manage your features 
to build your cost volumes or to compute the, the unsupervised loss, uh, the occlusion regions will give you bad results. So people are tr some people are trying to deal with it and we will discuss it uh, briefly later. So uh, how to make, uh, for, for the warping, how to make it differentiable? Uh, does anybody have some, uh, uh, want to know how to do it uh, other, other than just running the code? So for, for me, for myself, I, uh, I'm very interested in how to implement uh, different underlying methods. Uh, I'll take this working method as an example. So as the best way to show it is show the code. So I, I don't know if it is the real uh, quote from Linus Strauss, but let's, let's use this, this uh, quote. But uh, let's stop talking and show the code. So to understand how to make the warping differentiable is to uh, looking at how to impl implement warping inside uh, the uh, deep, deep learning models. So here I present uh, the code uh, copied from the PWC net uh, paper. And for that paper, they are, they people, they are uh, trying to do uh, optical flow task, but uh, the working mechanism is the same. And I modified the code a little bit, but uh, the principles is the same. So here is, is the PyTorch implementation. So the uh, uh, we, we can do it by three steps. The first step is to compute uh, the coordinates for each pixel, uh, which is happening here. So uh, we compute uh, the coordinate for each pixel, and then we normalize it, normalize the, uh, the coordinates, and this, this is the first step. The second step is using uh, some functionalities provided by the underlying uh, library I'm using. For this one, I'm using PyTorch. Uh, Py and there is a function called a grid sample. As what it basically does is using the uh, warped um, uh, coordinate uh, we, we have, uh, here is the V grid, to sample from the, image, uh, from the feature maps and uh, construct a, a new feature maps. So the last step is to uh, do some housekeeping that because, because we have some occlusion, we will have some out of, uh, uh, out of view uh, pixels. Uh, for example, here uh, from the red image, some pixels do not have a corresponding uh, places in the uh, reference image. And there is, there is no valid uh, pixel values here. We have to we have to do some housekeeping there, as basically is happening here. So uh, so this library provides us some uh, magical functions to make everything dis uh, differentiable. So for me, I would like to dive a little a little bit deeper. I would like to dive into how PyTorch implement the this function uh, because later we will do the same thing. So it's a very good uh, uh, opportunity for us to dive a little bit, bit uh, deeper. So for this particular function, the source code for PyTorch will be look, look like this. So uh, the, the, for PyTorch library, we have the CPU version and the GPU version. What I'm showing, showing you guys is the GPU version because for this kind of task, we basically have to use GPU. A CPU is not fast enough. So uh, to do the grid sample, uh, we can uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, we can use two methods to to sample features. Uh, one is uh, interpolation, and the other is nearest neighbor. So people always use interpolation. So interpolation is a bilinear interpolation. So what you have to do is compute the weights. Uh, you, you compute the, 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 uh, the warped coordinates from your orig original coordinates. And using the warped coordinates, you compute uh, uh, interpolation weights and then use the weights, you interpolate the feature values. So the source code will be looking like this, that uh, you have different uh, GPU function kernels. And uh, for uh, deep learning model, we have forward process and backward process. 
And for each process, there is a dedicated function. Uh, here, for example, uh, this grid sample uh, uh, function has a 3D kernel. This one is for forward computation. It computes uh, the, the warped uh, uh, coordinates and compute the uh, weights Compute, uh, compute the weights for, for the uh, uh, warped uh, coordinates and do the interpolation and do some boundary tracking or uh, stuff like that. And for backward, uh, you basically do the same thing. And you, it's, 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 it's like the forward process. You computed everything, but, but at last, you, you compute the derivative uh, based on the underlying mathematical uh, representation of the task you are doing. So this is this is what uh, uh, what it, uh, it looks like uh, underlying the PyTorch implementation. Later, I will uh, discuss how to do correlation uh, to compute the cost volumes. And for that one, we will build our own uh, PyTorch layers uh, like this. Okay, yeah. Is is okay. Uh, this is the uh, source code for the warping. And uh, if we want to train a model, you have to define some laws and use some optimizer. There is no some. Uh, there is no additional stories happening here. You can use the uh, you can use the loss function people normally use, uh, which is the smooth R R one loss. And you can use the Adam optimizer. They are, they are often uh, good enough to to do the training. And if you are uh, uh, trying to do some unsupervised training. Uh, there are some other uh, loss definitions we'll discuss later, like the uh, spatial structure similarity loss and the some uh, smoothness regulations. So, okay, so uh, let's talk about some other stuff. So um, for the deep lear learning models have these high performance non-learning models. They, uh, the most important thing is the cost volume. Uh, so for the high performance models, they are using uh, different kinds of cost volumes to to aggregate the, the features. And then uh, the models using the cost volumes have higher performance. So the first uh, uh, cost volume I want to talk about is 3D cost volume. So uh, why to use cost volume? The first reason is uh, for models do not use this, the results tend to be fuzzy. And uh, Cost room is a uh, medium uh, through which disparity prediction becomes a classification of all possible integer number of disparities. It's no longer a pure reg regression again uh, anymore. And uh, this makes the problem a little bit easier to do classification other than pure uh, regression on the disparities. So it's actually it's not a new idea in the uh, computer vision community. We are using it before uh, deep learning is popular. And uh, let, let's uh, review the matching cost thing. So we have to compute the matching cost uh, from the reference image for a image patch. And again, against a, a lot of uh, image patches in the uh, test images. So the key idea for the 3D uh, cost volumes looks like this. So you tell you a deep neural net that, hey, my a little dear net, neural net, uh, let me help to arrange pixels or the features so that you can easily compare the similarity between them. No worries, I've got everything out there. So uh, there is a paper to try to uh, elaborate what's happening to, uh, once, when, when you uh, construct your 3D uh, cost volume. So here we have the extracted features from a feature extraction layer for the uh, left image or the reference image uh, and the uh, right image or the test image. So here the blue, blue one is for, for the uh, reference one, uh, the red one is for the test one. And then you manually align them according to different disparity values. Uh, let's ignore the, uh, the uh, bottom two rows, only focusing on the first row. That uh, for, for the manually align, uh, align thing, I mean, you take out the features from those two images and align them uh, uh, multiple times. The, uh, the, uh, you align them for disparity number of times. 
So you align them the first time, there is no uh, offset between those two features. And then you offset the features from the reference image, one single pixel. And then you do it again for two pixels, only uh, offset the features from the reference, uh, from the test image. So you do it multiple times until you reach the maximum possible number of disparities. You, you, uh, the value is predefined. So I have another illustration here. So let's say here the, uh, the red one is the, uh, is the reference uh, uh, features you have uh, extracted. And the green one is the features you extracted from test image, the red image. So uh, uh, for these features, uh, they are three-dimensional tensors. We have a bunch of channels, and we have uh, uh, the feature uh, the dimension is h by w and by c channels. So dh is this direction and w is this direction. So to construct a 3D uh, uh, cost volume, what you do is you align those features. So you take a single layer of the features from both the uh, reference and the test feature maps, and they align them together. So this is the first uh, alignment. So you do it a couple of times. So for the next, you shift the reference uh, features for one pixel. And this uh, pair is uh, corresponds to disparity one. And uh, for other disparities, you do the same thing. And for the maximum disparity, uh, only one possible locations can be matched between those features. So once you al align them, you only keep the feature maps in, in between of these two dashed lines. So everything in between the dashed lines is your new feature, uh, feature, feature map. So once, once you do this, you get a, an additional dimension, uh, which is the D dimension. So uh, the, 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 uh, the number of, uh, for D is the maximum uh, disparity allowed plus one, the zero disparity. So to start to starting with, we have two feature maps with a uh, dimension of C uh, cross H cross W. Uh, after we construct the cost volume, uh, the feature map will be, uh, will, will have additional dimension, which is D. So it's D cross C cross H cross W. So using this method uh, and the U model performance jumps, uh, everything will be sharp and the training becomes easier. Okay, right. So uh, to do that, we simply manually manipulate the features. So I, I have two implementations. So later we will test one of them. Uh, the top one is from the uh, P, uh, PSMNet implementation from this paper. And the, the second one is from a paper of uh, last year's CVPR uh, conference. And this, this work is done from uh, another team from CMU. And uh, for the PSMNet, uh, they are doing exactly what I explained. Uh, we manually uh, aligned features. And for this work, and the, peop uh, the researchers there, they do additional, uh, uh, additional uh, computation, which is they first uh, compute the difference of the features, and then they align the, 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 the difference, uh, the, uh, the computer difference features. Uh, the alignment is basically the same, but the features uh, is, uh, there is additional manipulation of the features. So either way works. Okay, so this is how you can build a 3D cost volume to make everything, to make the performance better. And uh, there will be another method, which is uh, cross correlation based. And at least the two papers, and um, actually, most of the uh, works using cross correlation to build the cost volume is originated from those two works, uh, including myself. So why bother? Why, uh, if if we, we have a cost volume which is performance very good and give, give, give us very good performance, uh, why we want to do another kind of 
uh, cost volume construction? Uh, the answer is pretty simple because we have an extra dimension after we build the cost volume. Uh, for a large image or for large uh, discrepancy range, we do not have enough uh, GPU memory to, sh to save the 3D cost models. So we have to do other things to make uh, the, its memory efficient. So this is this, uh, to do that, we can use the cross correlation. So for, uh, for, the, for my last lab meeting presentation, I talked about uh, the definition of the cross correlation and uh, what kind of result we can get. And we can briefly review uh, the cross correlation, correlation thing. And here uh, we, I, I'm using the images as an uh, example. Uh, the actual correlation happens on the feature maps, not the images. So let's imagine these two images are the feature maps we extracted from images. So for cross correlation, we take two uh, uh, patches from the feature maps and we define a kernel size K. And then we will compare the kernel from the reference feature maps to a bunch of other kernels inside the test feature maps. So uh, originally this uh, cross correlation thing is for the uh, optical flow uh, prediction. So we will compare not only the X axis, we'll compare the Y axis as well. But for, for us, for the stereo we constructed, we only compare these X axis, that will be enough. So, Inside the kernel, we, we will uh, compare each uh, feature uh, along the channels, along all the channels. And we, we do it for each feature inside the kernel. Uh, using this uh, formulation, it's, it's, uh, it's just a multiplication and the summation. And after doing this, uh, we will not have an additional dimension because we, uh, we uh, I mean, when we do, when we do the uh, computation, we will uh, sum all the feature channels we have. So the feature channels just go away and the information will be incorporated into the summation. And we're starting with three dimension and, we, and the ending is the same dimension. And we're starting with, uh, with uh, multiple feature channels denoted by, by this C value. And we're ending up with uh, uh, the, the channels being a new number, which is the two times the maximum disparity plus one, uh, because we are essentially searching before and after the targeting uh, uh, feature, feature kernels in the test feature maps. So in this way, we do not get an additional uh, uh, dimension after we construct the cost volume. So let's look at the uh, source code again how to implement this. Okay, here uh, is, is my own uh, implementation of the, of the cross correlation. Uh, why, why I have to do this? Because uh, for the original implementation, the PyTorch version uh, is not supported anymore. And uh, I'm not doing the uh, optical flow stuff. I'm, I'm only searching one dimension. So I have to implement everything by myself. So uh, to, do, to do this, typically you, you implement two, uh, two things. The one is the Python interface that, uh, that uh, uh, to talk between your code and the CUDA, uh, underlying CUDA kernels. And here is the Python interface. It's relatively simple that you, you define a, a module and you define your forward uh, uh, function. Uh, here I'm using PyTorch. Uh, you forward uh, function and you take two feature maps and you do the forward. And there is no backward uh, function call for the module. The backward fu function call will be on other places. So this is the first part and you can examine the source code later uh, if you are interested. The second part is the CUDA thing. It's the, it's the uh, uh, is implemented by C++, uh, C++, C++ code. So uh, typically you have to implement uh, two uh, interface functions, one for forward computation and one for backward computation. So for these two 
is uh, the structure is similar what we have seen for the grid sample of source code of the PyTorch implementation. It will be look like this. So the CUDA kernels have these forward and and backward thing uh, 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 here, and and for cross correlation is just a giant uh, uh, for loop uh, inside for loops. Actually, there will be four for loops. So uh, you do all the for loops, you you do the multiplication and the summation, and then here is the uh, multiplication and summation. And for the backward, you typically do the same thing, but uh, uh, the the thing you are uh, you, you are adding together and the multiply together is is a, is a little bit different from the forward. And uh, again, if you are interested, you can examine the code more closely. Uh, later on in the exercise session, we will compile this code by ourselves. Okay, this is how you can uh, implement this uh, for stereo reconstruction. So there is some quiz um, that you can have a guess what kind of kernel size people are using for computing correlation. So kernel is, is this thing. And uh, I'm using this uh, small green rectangular represent a single feature with all of its channels. So what kind of kernel size are you using? So surprisingly, people are using kernel size one. So the kernel size is one, but individual feature have a bunch of channels. So for optical flow computation, people are using 1,000 channels. So the kernel size is one, but we have a bunch of channels. So we don't have to compare neighboring uh, features. We only compare single features, but for a single feature, we have multiple channels. Uh, we can think a little bit uh, is correlation, cross-correlation really measuring similarity. So when I impl implement this code, I run into this, this problem. It's actually, it's not most of the case. So let's, let's say, uh, 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 let's imagine for correlation, it's just you multiply the feature together and you add them up. So if the result is, if the, if the value of the result is, is large, uh, you want it to mean that the two patches are similar. If the value is low, you, you want to mean that it's not similar. But in reality, it's not the case because you can multiply a feature kernel with another feature kernel with relatively larger values, average values. So no matter, uh, no matter whether the, the feature kernels are similar or not, the summation will be large. So there will be ambiguity. So what we can do is we can implement a zero, no, zero normal cross correlation or a cosine descent, uh, basically the same thing. So this uh, zero normal cross correlation will be much better to use, but it will be slow because uh, when, uh, typically when you do the backward, uh, you have to do a lot more computation in order to normalize everything. So uh, I have a implementation, but I didn't use it. I find out, find out that if you normalize the features instead, you typically get the same performance, but everything will be faster. So we are using this, this method and not this one. Okay, so uh, uh, there, there is some, some variant of the cross-correlation thing. And people were, uh, last year, uh, some, some other people proposed, we, we, we can, uh, uh, let's do not uh, collapse all the feature channels we have. Let's divide the feature channels into different groups and only do the correlation inside those groups. So you, we will get a, an additional dimension, but for that dimension, the, the number is small. Uh, let's say you divide the features into four groups or two groups, so you have additional dimension, but in that dimension, you only have uh, several groups. So you can do that. Okay, so uh, we have discussed two methods to construct 
the, the, the cost curve. And uh, uh, so far, what, what, what have discussed is uh, the common components, the cost volumes, and I will skip some topics because uh, I, I think that, not, that uh, they are not important in terms of getting high performance. Uh, typically, is how, how, do, how you do the cost, cost volume regulation. Uh, from my experience, you just use some multi-layer um, uh, convolutional layers and uh, add some skip connections and you can use some kind of uh, hourglass. You can stack hourglass uh, structures uh, linearly and that will be good enough. And there is no some magic, magical things happening. And uh, for disparity refinement, if you still find the result is not sharp enough, you can do some refinement. But for the structures, the refinement layer, you can use some simple, simple structure. You can use UNET, UNET again. Uh, it, it will work. And uh, uh, the people are trying to use some tricks like dilated kernels for refinement and maybe some more complex refinement method and as, as I listed here. But I don't think that's important. You just stack some convolutional layers there because for refinement, they typically only concern about the local features. They do not have to uh, argue or uh, uh, take care about the global features, uh, like what we do for the cost volume. Okay, so I will uh, uh, briefly discuss how to do uh, and supervise the training. So uh, it turns out for stereo reconstruction, people are usually do uh, the training in a supervised way. Um, there are there are some works uh, covering how to do it in an unsupervised way. It's typically the same as the a monocular depth prediction or optical flow. I, I list some uh, literatures here. And uh, why we would like to do unsupervised learning? Well, the reason is, I think everybody knows that to get ground truth data is, is hard and is expensive. And uh, if we can do it unsupervised, um, then we can save a lot of things. And um, there, there are some other tasks that uh, you can jointly do with the stereo or depth prediction. I, I call them multitask models. So for some multitask models, we do not have one truth labels for the other task uh, other than the disparities. So we may have to do uh, unsupervised learning. Uh, typically for some multi-view stereo and monocular depth prediction, people uh, tend to use uh, unsupervised learning. Uh, what we are going to discuss is some typical uh, models people are using to construct unsupervised learning. Uh, the most important one is the loss functions. So from uh, Yahweh's talk, um, uh, the, the visual dometry uh, talk, uh, tutorial, that we know that there are some structures and loss functions, loss functions we, we can use to describe similarities between images. So the same thing happens here, that you can use appearance of photometric measures as you unsupervise the loss. So the most famous one is the, uh, using the spatial structure similarity as the appearance loss. And then as, as, uh, we want the disparity to be as smooth as possible, but only have uh, uh, disparity changes, large changes, uh, uh, between the edge uh, of, of between the uh, boundary, uh, object boundaries. So object boundaries in images will be represented as image edges. So we have some kind of edge where smoothness loss as a regulation. And uh, there are some other uh, separation signal we can get typically from stereo setup. That uh, for example, we can use left to right consistency check as a loss separation signal so for this particular loss, uh, what we are doing is we take a prediction from the reference image uh, on, a, on a particular pixel coordinate and we find the corresponding pixel in the test image and the get the, the disparity prediction for that, for that image location in the test image. And uh, the disparity for those two pixels in those two images should be the same. Uh, if there is a inconsistent inconsistency between those two disparities, there will be a loss. 
So at least those reference papers here, um, the, you, you can uh, reference those papers later. And uh, we can do more. We can use some uh, interesting uh, uh, unsupervised loss definitions. Here I, I show a, a people trying to use the uh, Hamming distance of a uh, uh, census transform of feature maps as a unsupervised loss. It's really interesting. Uh, you can check out yourself. They have uh, a, a source code provided as, as, uh, as I listed here. So uh, for this particular example, the mathematical equations or uh, description of the method and the actual code uh, are different. Uh, you, can you can check out that. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting how people implement those kinds of uh, unsupervised loss. Okay, so the last uh, a component for these deep learning, uh, uh, recent deep learning methods I'd like to talk about is some uh, real-time stuff. So why we like to do some real-time stuff? Uh, for, for us, for we, we will de deploy, uh, deploy those models on, on hardware, uh, running on some uh, low-power platforms uh, on robots, something like that. Uh, but all the high performance models are heavy. They consume lots of power, a lot of GPU uh, memory, and on some uh, uh, embedded systems, it tends to run slow, uh, run slowly. And those high performance uh, models are trying to pursue extreme accuracy. So sometimes for uh, some tasks, we don't have to have that kind of accuracy. So for example, with for the average error of less than one pixel, we may, we may don't need to do that. And uh, for some uh, application like the autonomous uh, navigation for driving a scenario, uh, uh, we, we don't have to pursue high density. For density, I mean, uh, we don't have to predict a very dense prediction. We can just uh, ignore some region of images and only keep and focusing our computing power on some important or interesting regions, uh, like the ground or the uh, obstacles on the ground uh, for uh, autonomous driving or navigation tasks. And typically, in the literature, they they, there are two types of uh, real-time implementation of learning methods. So the two types are which one is uh, one is running on desktop class GPUs, which is relatively powerful and can run really fast. And the other uh, category is running on mobile GPUs like TX2 and uh, achieve uh, real-time uh, performance. So I will uh, talk about two, maybe two methods. One is called AnyNet. So for this, uh, this structure, uh, there are two features for this uh, uh, learning method. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, they are using a, a Spatial method called spatial propagation model, and this model uh, is, is originally designed for an, an other task, uh, for segmentation tasks to to refine the segmentation boundaries. And the other feature is uh, they are uh, doing multiple stage of of prediction. Uh, between the different stage, they are trying to predict uh, the disparity differences between stages. So in this way they can restrict uh, the amount of work uh, each, uh, each stage should be doing uh, one through the inference. So because it is multi-stage structure, uh, they can do any time retrieval of the prediction and it can run pretty fast. So this is for, this, uh, this is for the spatial propagation model that uh, we can aggregate, aggregate information from different uh, directions. I won't go to uh, details of this implementation, and then we just look at the performance. So the uh, the thing we we have want to concern additionally is the is the uh, how fast this model can be running. So as you can see here on a TX2 uh, uh, hardware, it can achieve uh, nearly uh, real time performance, and the uh, accuracy is. Uh, good enough for, for their, uh, I think, for their uh, uh, tasks. So we can compare other uh, methods. Uh, 
uh, about the accuracy and speed. So something is missing here. So from the papers like this work, uh, they, we didn't get any good or deep understanding how to make a deep neural net fast. So the, the method people are using are trivial or naive. So typically we can try to do less stuff, uh, use low resolution and use uh, a less uh, stages. Uh, uh, and then the, the model will be faster. And we use some small models and use less parameters for our models. Let, uh, use some lightweight model or do some uh, metrics of knowledge distillation stuff and make the deep neural network a little bit smaller. And the people are always doing multi-scale because for real-time application, there will be uh, the, the anytime retrieval characteristics is sometimes is mandatory. Uh, you, you have to respond to the uh, upstream uh, uh, program that the program require, uh, require a disparity map. You have to give the disparity map uh, uh, in a, uh, uh, I mean, a quick fashion. So in summary, there's no magic, magic things happens to make this deep neural net, network are running faster. Uh, but uh, you can still do multitask. So the other uh, example I want to bring about a multitask real-time uh, implementation. For this one, uh, the people are trying to do uh, this segmentation and this uh, stereo uh, uh, reconstruction at the same time. And everything can be run uh, relatively faster on a, a TX2 uh, setup. But uh, because we are doing more predictions uh, this actual speed is, uh, is, is slower than what I get from any net. And uh, we can do more things like uh, uh, from, from last year's VPR paper, uh, people are trying to do real time online adoption, adoption of uh, stereo reconstruction. And you can refer to this uh, paper and they can achieve only three, uh, the frame rate, frame rate is only three FPS on ATX2 set. Okay, so uh, this is for the uh, the components and how we can build a, a deep neural network for a high performance uh, stereo reconstruction. So we talk about how to do the front end, how to compute cost volume, but we didn't uh, talk about how to do the cost uh, the cost regulation. But you can but you can use some trivial uh, structures like multi layers and skip skip connections. And we didn't, we didn't show how to do classification and regression, and I will show it in the source code. And the refinement, uh, also I didn't show how to do it, but you can use some simple structures. And we have discussed some uh, unsupervised uh, methods and real-time considerations. So I think it's a good time to do another round of hands-on uh, exercise. And then if we have time, we can, we can talk uh, briefly on how to do some advanced learning. Uh, for, for those ad advanced learning things, uh, I would like to uh, I would like to talk about only one topic, which is the uh, uncertainty estimation. So I think we do not have to have time to 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 discuss all of the steps. But for uh, uncertainty, we will be doing some exercise on. And the, for deep learning models, people are doing two kinds of uncertainty prediction. Uh, one is a direct classification in a supervised way. And people, the, what people are trying to do is to predict a zero or one, a binary label, that uh, if, uh, if uh, any disparity prediction for each pixel is, uh, is uh, uh, what kind of confidence you have. If you predict one, that you, you are saying that I'm confident about my prediction. If I predict the zero for this pixel, uh, which means uh, the disparate prediction is unreliable. And the other way is a probabilistic way. And uh, typically we regress a number to represent uh, the uncertainty of the disparity prediction. And it's often trained and on an unsuppressed way. And this is the, uh, uh, this is, this model is what we will be uh, uh, doing exercise on. So for this probabilistic, uh, implementation of the disparity, 
uh, I'm using a simple model uh, developed by uh, by this uh, author in his uh, PhD thesis uh, in 2009. And what we do is we intro introduce a new parameter we want, uh, we, a new output, output we want the deep neural network to predict the disparity alongside and uncertainty. And the uncertainty is the, is here is the SP value. So uh, everything inside these uh, uh, vertical bars, uh, which this is the uh, IR, IR2 norm, is the supervised signal that we have the true label YP, which is the true disparity. And FP is the disparity pre prediction we have from our deep neural net. And the SP value do not have any supervision signal. So this is a trained unsupervised, in the unsupervised way. So we multiply, uh, we, we sum up SP value here, we, and we do a summation. And also we will use the SP value here uh, with a exp exponential and multiply this, this value, this exponential value to the supervision signal here. And we do a summation over all pixels. So in this way, what we get is that uh, during the training, if the model tends to make a large prediction error, uh, compare against the, the true disparity value, uh, the loss will be, will be large for this particular pixel. So, the model can predict a large SP value to constrain the separation signal here and make the overall loss smaller. Uh, in the opposite way, if the model we, we are training gave a very good prediction for some pixel P, and this value will be small because we predict a very good disparity compared against the, the true disparity. And the, the value for the L2 norm is so small that we can, pre, we can, we can predict a small SP value to bring down this term. So the SP value represents the confidence we have for the current disparity pre prediction for a single pixel P. So I think I do not have time to explain everything here, but, the, but this is the underlying principle. And we will do some experiments on this model. So I think it's a time for us to move to the uh, exercise hands-on session. Uh, okay, this is, this is for the first link. Uh, we will do some exercise on the uh, 3D cost worm. Uh, does everyone uh, get the link and get and make a copy for this uh, a notebook? You can you can make a copy here you know, from the file uh, menu and save and uh, use uh, save a copy uh, in Drive. Okay, okay. So the, we will move on with this. And uh, from from previous uh, tutorial, I think uh, people are familiar with. The Google Colab thing, and the, for our exercise, it's really simple that we we run it, and uh, we fit into some uh, stereo images, and we get uh, the dis disparity prediction out of the model. So, uh, please uh, targeting those this this. Uh, I mean, you can uh, click this uh, three run sample code uh, uh, code box and connect to the runtime. And uh, please make sure you're, you're using the GPU uh, runtime. You can check it by clicking the uh, runtime menu and change run, runtime type. It should be GPU. So once you do that, uh, you, you click this, uh, this code block here, which, which actually is not code block. Is, is only uh, some text and uh, click runtime and then run before this code block. And what this notebook does is uh, it uh, installs the de dependencies and clone the GitHub repository I prepared for this uh, exercise and 
uh, create some uh, uh, temporary uh, folders for us to upload our pre-trained model. So if, if you run all the uh, code, uh, that's, uh, you are running into some troubles because we do not have any pre-trained models yet. So like you, uh, you can see from my screen, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm done running all the uh, code blocks before this, this, this section. So if, you, so if you do that, you can refresh the temporary uh, fold, uh, file systems we have on Colab. Uh, you click this, uh, this button here, which is the files button, and you click the refresh button here, and please uh, expand this subfolder, uh, uh, temporary folder, and the targeting the folder under PSMNU. Uh, PMSNU means uh, a, a ex extension of the PSMNet. Uh, I add some uh, uncertainty prediction uh, to the PSMNet. So you're targeting the pre-trained uh, uh, folder and do an upload to this folder. So the pre-trained model is, uh, if you uh, download from the uh, Google Drive, it will, it will be in the PSMU subfolder. So the name will be, uh, there are only two uh, pre-trained models. Uh, one for uh, color images, RGB image, and one for grayscale images. And we upload those two uh, pre-trained models to this folder. So, it takes uh, maybe one minute to do that. So once you upload uh, the pre-trained model, you can carry on to run uh, the, the last code block. Uh, make sure the uploading is a uh, success because I have experienced that uh, sometimes the uploading failed and we do not have a complete uh, pre-trained model in our temp temporary folder. Okay, so I've already uploaded everything. And uh, the last code block is, is what it's doing is uh, it's also reading a JSON file. In that JSON file, there's a couple of uh, stereo uh, samples listed in that file. And uh, it will run two times. The first time uh, in a uh, RGB mode and the second time in a uh, grayscale mode. And we just run this, uh, this code block with uh, shift plus enter or control plus enter, whatever you want, and you just run it. So as things are running, you can see the disparity predictions will be coming up. So uh, similarly to, similar to the non-learning model, if the camera intrinsics is available, uh, I will generate a point cloud alongside the disparity. And we can we can download the, the point cloud to to our local machine, and the exam the point cloud. So I, I have uh, this this has predict some uh, results for me in the in the collab, and uh, for uh, samples we do not have a ground truth label. We we do not ground truth disparity like this one. And this is the images I, I take. Uh, Vikun has taken in Japan for the Shimizu project. And for this one, we do not have uh, ground truth labels. And I only show the predicted disparity and the, predict, and the predicted uh, uncertainty as grayscale, grayscale images. So uh, th there is the reference image, test image, disparity, and the uncertainty. Uh, for cases that we do have a ground truth disparity, uh, the, the results will be rendered as the two images and true disparity, predicted dis disparity, and, and uh, the, the error uh, compared with the true disparity and the uncertainty. And the, the error and the uncertainty are, are, are drawn, are represented as, as uh, color scales. I'm using different color scales. And you can check the color scales here. So I'm using this uh, 
color scales from this package. And uh, for, for disparity, I'm using the rainbow color scale. On every map, I'm using the cool warm color scale. And then certainly the DET dash uh, underscore uh, L light scene uh, color scale. And you can, you, can, uh, you can see what kind of uh, color scale it looks like. It's lots of color scales. Okay, uh, this is for the uh, Midbury data set. Uh, here we have the ground truth uh, disparity, and this is the prediction. Uh, you can see we have some bad, pre uh, uh, bad predictions here on this wall. And uh, uh, the overall result is not that uh, satisfactory. But for this particular example, the grayscale one maybe predict better. Yes, let's download that instead. So on the on the terminal, or not terminal, on the output on the uh, collab notebook, I list the uh, inference time on this uh, on Google Colab and the GPU memory consumption. So you can compare what kind of GPU we need for for these uh, image sizes. So all the image are I have to do a little bit down sample because we do not have that kind of um, GPU memory to fit the original resolution or image size. Uh, you can check out the, the image size and memory consumption. My additional thing I would like to, sh to show is how to compute um, the disparity, uh, the, the, the uncertainty. So the, the source code is hosted on this re repository and the actual code to compute the, the uncertainty is here. It's really, really simple. Let me see. Okay, okay. So it's here. So you can, uh, from the original setup, uh, we have uh, we have to predict the disparity as a final regression. So well, we look like this, that the final regression is a convolutional layer and it, it, the output channel is one. This is for disparity. And uh, to predict the uncertainty, it can be as simple as additional, an additional uh, uh, channel alongside this disparity prediction. So this is the last layer of the of of the model, so the model only has two channels, one for the original disparity, and the other one is for the uncertainty value. It can be as simple as this one. So let's say originally you have a model to predict only the disparity, and the, this the channel of this layer is one, and you just change it to two, and everything works. And uh, if you examine the at the prediction closely, you can see that we tend to have high uncertainty along the edges of objects because for this for these places we have disparity, uh, discontinuity, and occlusions. So the model the model learns that these uh, these areas along the edges should have high higher uh, uncertainty, but for the the flat regions, uh, the model learns that. Uh, it can predict low uncertainty. Okay, um, I think we have about a couple of second uh, minutes to to do the, the final exercise on the other uh, learning model. Uh, if you using the second uh, collab uh, link I provided, it's typically the same. Uh, but there is only one uh, thing I would like to point out that to run this uh, Google Colab uh, uh, notebook, uh, you uh, uh, additional things happening here that we will compile the customized PyTorch layer, uh, which is the uh, cross correlation layer, and you can check out the source code if you want. So to after the compiling, we have to manually install 
the new PyTorch uh, custom layer into the, uh, the Python environment. So for Colab, we have to do, um, we have to trick, trick the, the system that to, to, to refresh the, uh, the Python environment. So we have to do an, an exit here. So the first of all, we have to uh, run everything uh, above uh, these, uh, these code blocks until we hit the exit command. So for this one, we can do this. Uh, this will be slower because uh, the first time we compile the code uh, on Google Colab, um, it, it takes uh, maybe one or two minutes to compile the uh, the GPU uh, the, the, the the GPU kernel. Okay, it's, it's done compiling, and we will install everything to the uh, Python environment of, the, of Google Colab, and we do an exit. And the uh, Colab will complain that something bad has happened and everything crashed. That's okay because we intentionally need to do that. And then uh, it's, it's, a, it's the same story that we have to upload the pre-trained model to the uh, dedicated folder. So we targeting this uh, code block and do a, do a run before command and this will create the uh, the folders to to save our pre-trained model. Okay, then if we refresh our temporary folder in the correlation subfolder, they will all, they will all be a pre-trained folder which is empty, and we can upload the pre-trained model here. So. There will be two models, uh, one for the color image and the other one for the uh, grayscale image. So after uploading, uh, it's, it's probably the same that you run the rest of the code blocks and uh, there will be a JSON file here. I listed file content, content and uh, the code will run through this JSON file and we try to predict the disparity for different test cases and if a intrinsic parameter is available, uh, the point cloud will be also generated. Uh, for this particular model, I'm, I'm, I'm using the kernel size one. And there is one single problem is that when I train the model, I constrain the disparity, maximum disparity range. So there will be one case that you can see a, a failure of predicting disparity uh, out of the disparity range, which is the model is trained. Okay, I've run this, this code. Uh, the failure case is for this one, because for this image, the, the maximum true disparity is uh, out of the training range of possible disparities. So anything that is near the camera around, uh, around this region will not have good predictions. But for other cases, it's, it's, uh, the performance is uh, good enough. And I, and I also list the GPU memory consumption and the inference time uh, as comparison to the other uh, method. Again, uh, the, the results will be saved alongside the source code. Okay, if, if uh, nobody has any questions, let's say we call it a day. And thank you very much for everybody to to being with me <laughs> for this this long time. <laughs>